Hello, everyone. How are you today? Are you feeling bad missing lunch? Are you good? Can we hold out for like 45 minutes? I probably won't go. I won't drag you through a whole hour. Um, this is going to be like 90% demo, um, but I will have some drawings. How many of you were in my talk yesterday? OK, cool. Uh, this is different in that I will do just a few slides, then do a bunch of demo, and then maybe show you one slide. But uh, yesterday, I went back and forth, so it'll be slightly different. But it's still a lot of demo. Um, I assume the audience is quite similar. Let me ask you about some technologies and see what you know. How many of you know what code-ready containers is? Decent amount, but less than half, I would say. How many of you know what OpenShift is? OK, that's a lot more. How many of you know what Podman is? OK, that's good. How many of you know what Quay.io is? Good. Eh, about half, maybe a little more than half. Um, how many of you know what the Red Hat Container Catalog is? Not that many. OK, so I kind of know Code Ready Containers, Red Hat Container Catalog. I will have to describe that a little more, a little more. But that's OK. Um, so I am going to, this, this talk will be, unlike yesterday's, yesterday's was strictly like a how, like, or how something works. So it's more like Discovery Channel, documentary. Like, I didn't actually show you how to do anything new at all. Like, at the end of that talk, you could do nothing new at all. Just continue to run containers like you had always done. The only thing that you could do was maybe meta operation. You could probably troubleshoot things better and maybe architect things better. But you didn't actually, you weren't able to do anything new. This talk is, is focused more on how to use a bunch of technologies together in a use case in actually a bunch of use cases, like five major use cases, um, and kind of get your brain around the, I, I hate to use, in English we say a buzzword, like a cloud native kind of way of thinking, which is slightly different than the way you would think with traditional infrastructure. My background is, is a ton of, of, of infrastructure background. So I came from American Greetings back, how many of you know what e-cards are? Not that many, how, how old are you guys? Like, how many people are over 40? Raise your hand. You guys don't remember what e-cards are? Uh, OK. <laughs> so long ago in the early days of the internet, like the mid-90s and late 90s, um, we used to send each other like gift cards online. Not even gift cards. They were, they were like good tidings, like you know, best wishes cards and things on Halloween or like, well, the six major holidays, like Christmas, New Year's, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day was huge. Uh, during Valentine's Day, the site that I worked for, American Greetings, we were like top 10 largest sites in the world. Um, so I managed large numbers of thousands of Linux servers back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when, when uh, uh, it was like still a pretty big amount of Linux servers. So, but the funny part is, even to this day, with everything I'm going to show you today with containers, the problems are identical. It's a matter of how to like, share code configuration and data among a large group of resources, be them a bunch of servers or virtual machines or containers. But either way, it's, it's about distributing these workloads and doing the same thing. So it's funny, my entire career basically has been the same problem. I've just been working on it with new, new technologies the whole time. And it's gotten easier. And so how many, here, actually here, before I even go deeper, I'll ask you one question. How many of you think Kubernetes is complex? Raise your hand. So this is the funny part. I think the business problem is complex. I think running large-scale web properties with thousands of services is complex. And I think Kubernetes is actually the easiest way I've ever seen to do that. If I were to show you what we did back in the late 90s, it was way more complex than what we're doing here, way more complex. We had configuration in 100 different places, and uh, there was all these different files you had to edit to add a service. And even worse, trying to get rid of a service and delete it was much harder. So I'm going to talk through kind of the beginning of containers here and the use cases that I'm going to walk through, and then I'll start demoing. So five, six years ago, how long was it? 2014. It was six years ago now. I started with Docker. Um, started playing with Docker, and I immediately saw that the exact things that we always wanted to do before, we wanted to find, run, and build stuff. Um, so it's basic collaboration, right? We wanted to go find something that is somewhat existing that already kind of does what I need, pull it down, mess with it, run it, get my brain around it, understand it, learn it. Then I immediately need to change it a little bit to add new value. And then 
then, then from there, we'll, we'll get later. But this exact set of use cases is exactly what containers does, right? So if you think about an open source library, this is what you do. You go out, you search GitHub, you look for something that kind of does what you need, you pull it down, you run it, usually compile it, run it, kind of figure out what it needs to do. This is what we did back in the late 90s. Um, and, then, and then build something new on top of it. Just a little layer of value that's the thing that I'm going to contribute to make it just a little bit more what I need it to do. This is a fundamentally different thinking than 30 or 40 years ago where you had to write it all from scratch. Open source changed the world. So, so I will say containers couldn't have happened without open source. But now we want it to be easier. So back when I first played with Docker, I would Docker find. I would go out to Docker Hub, look for an existing container, typically a base image, add, you know, run the base image, make sure it worked, and then I would add a layer to the container image. And then what do you do? Like, that's useless, right? Like, if I add value, but then I can't share that value, it's basically useless. Like, these are fundamental, like, sort of use cases of, of collaboration, be it with containers or not, or with anything that you're writing, any kind of code. So then I realized, and oh, and wait, I want to back up. So some people get stuck here. I would call these, like, the regular Docker people. They get stuck here. They just want to keep pulling down a container image, running it, building something new, sharing it in a registry server, and then they just want to keep doing that. They don't want to go to the next level because they're scared because they think Kubernetes is complex. But really what they don't understand is the business problem is complex. Running highly available web services at scale is a tough problem. It's always been hard. It's been hard for my entire career. But I would say that it's easier now. Um, and so then you have kind of the next problem. How do I integrate this, right? How do I make all of these services run together? So say, say I have a simple web app that's just a database and a web server. Fine, that's not too hard. I can run that on my laptop. Um, but say I have a service that has 12 different services. It has a caching layer in front of the database, a caching layer in front of the web server. It has um, a layer 7 firewall that prevents certain things going from the web server to the, to the, you know, to the database. Um, there's a couple different web services that all talk to each other that do one thing. And so now we're up to like 10, 12 services. Now integrating these 12 services and getting them all to work together and then pulling one out, changing it a little bit and putting it back in, that's the business problem that we're trying to solve. To be honest, again, 20 years ago, that was still the business problem that we were solving. But with containers, this gets easier. But the problem is people get scared at share. They kind of get stuck and they want to go back and they want to run a single node, they'll want to run a single node container with Docker or Podman and just want to keep running that and they get scared to go to the next level. I'm going to show you why, one, that's not that hard to do. And uh, how many of you were in Ir Irvishi and, and Sally's talk earlier today? They showed something really cool, uh, Podman kube generate, or generate kube, which I'm going to show you too. But, uh, but I'm going to show you why in the context of this use case and how you go from use case to use case. So also I would say the first Three-ish years of containers was kind of everybody figuring out this up to share. Then, you know, the last four-ish years, Kubernetes took off, and we started to realize we want to integrate and then deploy with a, a YAML file that describes what the application and all of the services and how they interact looks. Now, again, it might be intimidating to get into that YAML file and start to understand it, but it's a lot easier than what we did 20 years ago. What we did 20 years ago is we had configuration in Apache, configuration in the load balancers, configuration in the network with like routing protocols. We had configuration all over the place. We had it in DNS. We had it, uh, I mean, we had it all over the place. There was probably 10, 12 different places that I had to go write config files to bring a service up. And worse, when I would bring it down, I had to delete it in 10 different places and then hope I didn't break dependencies somewhere else in the environment. With Kubernetes, it's a heck of a lot easier. It's a single command to basically bring down a service. So the deprecation of a service is so much easier. Okay, so let's walk through what I mean because it was pretty high level. Today I have it scripted because I'm not as crazy uh, as I was yesterday. So <laughs> yesterday I just did it live. I was like, let's just try this. Um, but this one should go fairly smooth. So we're gonna start with find. So when you wanna go find a container image, right? Let's think through this from a security perspective. Um, historically, we would look at Docker Hub. One of the challenges with Docker Hub is that anybody can write a container there. So it's a read-write registry. And so, of course, as we know, the public internet is always a dangerous place. And we've seen tons of uh, articles about, um, you know, uh, 
Bitcoin miners being embedded in container images. How many of you have heard about this? This is a very common thing. So you'll go and download a container image and it has a Bitcoin miner embedded in it. You're running your web server and it, behind the scenes in that container, it's also running a Bitcoin miner and shipping that stuff back. Um, it's always about money. It's always just follow the money and you'll find why people do this stuff. Um, but in a nutshell, what I look at is here, let's, let's run this. So if we do this on a Red Hat system, Podman search, we will now see, you will see something here, registry.access.redhat.com. This is actually something called the Red Hat Container Catalog. Um, this is a controlled you know, environment where Red Hat publishes all of the official container images from Red Hat. So I have a lot more confidence in these container images because I know they come from a trusted source. I know they're built, it, it's a, as we say in English, it's a walled garden where I know I'm starting from a good trusted starting point. And now if I add value, again, now I'm finding something that I think I trust. Um, and now if I add value, I have, I have what we call chain of custody. So I trust the original custody, the original party that had custody of these, you know, of these bits, and then I bring it down, and now I have custody. But let's say I kind of trust Red Hat, but I'm not 100% sure that I trust Red Hat. Like, I think they, they build decent stuff, but you know, I'm not 100% sure that I trust them. So let me show you what the container catalog is. So uh, let's do this. I guess I lied, some of it is not scripted. Um, so let's say I wanna pull down a base image. How many of you know what Red Hat Universal Base Image is? So with the release, I will explain it. With the release of RHEL 8 at Summit last year, we released something called Red Hat Universal Base Image. It is a container base image that is essentially a RHEL base image. It's, not, it's the same bits. So it's the same trusted bits that we have that have a 10 year life cycle that there are backports of security and features, but it is contained in a container image that has a different end user license agreement that allows people to just redistribute it freely. So um, this was a challenge we had because our old business model, the only way we could really control the bits because they're all open source was say, hey, we won't support you if you install a bunch of copies of this and don't pay us. So it was really a contractual agreement. The problem with this was is in the world of containers, the install method changes. If you think about it, the developer is now installing the software and the operating system bits together in a container image and then deploying those, you know, and then sharing those all over the place. But we had never given people the right to share those bits everywhere, um, or at least not contractually. So we released uh, Universal Base Image um, and we, we basically released it for RHEL 7 and RHEL 8. But let's say I, I look at Universal Base Image and I say, I think I trust this. I think I would use this because I think it's trustworthy but I'm not 100% sure. So what we do is we actually try to be very transparent about what is going on. So if you look over here, there's something called the health index. So right now, Red Hat Universal Base Image is rated as an A. We actually have an algorithm that we score these publicly, and we say if there's like one critical, it drops to a, a C or, you know, there's this different algorithm that allows it to drop down in grade. And um, you'll see that over time, I wanna show you, Container, people don't really think through container images. They age, we say, like cheese, not like wine. Like, they do not get better with age. Container images will always fall in, in security because what happens is trust is temporal, right? Like, I might trust what Red Hat released today, but I don't trust what Red Hat released three years ago because it's clearly going to have some CVEs in it and, you know, different, different security exploits that have been discovered in the bits that we have. So if you look here, the top tag here is a RHEL 8.1 or a UBI 8.1 container image, but as it gets older, um, it gets lower grade. Um, and so you definitely want to try to, you want, this, this highlights a problem with container images. You have to constantly pull the latest one if you want to be, uh, you know, if you want to have the security issues patched. And that means that you need to rebuild all of the layers that you've built on top, which now means that I can't just build it once, ship it, and forget about it it means I need to constantly be able to reship it very quickly. I, it's a very fundamentally different way of thinking about it. Containers feel really easy, but they're not completely easy. Um, and so you'll see here, this one's a month old, this one's three months, four months, six, seven, blah, 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 and they get lower in grade as we go older. Um, and the, the 8.0 one is the one we released you know, at, at launch. Um, so okay, so I like that Red Hat shows me some of these things and actually has an algorithm for how they grade it. I, 
not to be too mean, but, but there are, if you look at other registries out there, there's, there's official images on these, on these registries. But there's no definition of what official means. It's just using a fancy word to describe a container image. So if you go grab the, the official, I don't know, um, the official Apache image, it is a very different set of criteria than if you go grab the official MongoDB image. There's no, there's no standard on what official means. It's just some people put a little seal on it and say this is the official one. And so what you have to, what you have to take away from that and start to understand when you're finding a container image is, is trust is really something that I construct in my mind. It's a warm and fuzzy feeling. There's no, there's no, there's no standard for whether it's secure or not. You know, Dan pointed out, you know, it's the porridge, right? Is it too hot? Is it really hot? Is it warm or is it just right? Um, and you know, the hotter it is, the harder it is to use. So obviously, if you wanted completely secure container images, you would build them yourself from scratch all the time. And then it would be exactly what you want with the exact security, with the exact patches you want. But it's inconvenient. So we end up trusting other people. So I, I say you have to tr download something that you, a trusted thing from a trusted source. So again, in this case scenario, Red Hat tries to provide some data to prove that we're like actually doing something legitimate here with these container images and, and kind of transparently show that we're rebuilding them. And so if you pull the latest one, it's actually going to be you know, something that's fairly high quality. All right, so let's say I've analyzed this enough and I'm like, okay, I think what I've seen in the container catalog is decent. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical security minded person, so I never love anything. It's only decent to me. Um, but so we go out and look, I said, um, and then we say we've looked at this Red Hat Universal Base Image and we're happy with it. We're like, okay, I think I would download this. Okay, so let's do a Podman run. Uh, we move on to running it. Um, let's look at this thing. Cat slash Etsy OS release. Okay, so this is a RHEL 8.1. This is the UBI 8.1 image that I showed you that's up there, the latest. Um, looks pretty good. We could you know, do all kinds of things in here, but I'm just gonna get out. Again, not much interesting that you can do with running a base image, right? Nobody runs an operating system. There's a saying back in the day, 10-ish years ago, um, nobody runs an operating system just to run an operating system. Now, I'm a geek, so I do do that, but, but in, in pub, you know, for, for our, my company, I never do that, right? There's no reason to just run an operating system. So really, it has to, we have to build something on top of it to make it interesting. And so we're moving on now. We've went from finding to run was a pretty short step. Build is the next step. Um, so now let's build something. This is a very simple Docker file that I created here that just adds a small, you know, I add proc ps because I like to have ps in my container image. I like to have IP, you know, I like to have route and I like to have ping. So I add some tools here just to build kind of a, what I would consider a core build back in the day, but I would call this like a container core build. Um, if you don't know what a core build is, a lot of corporations, when they would install their operating systems, would kind of standardize on what all utilities they want installed so that when you would log into a server, you would have the same tools everywhere and it would make troubleshooting easier, it would make installing applications easier. We kind of see the same thing happening with containers. So, so I'm kind of showing this is kind of a miniature core build. And now, let's look at this new image. You'll see I've created the UBI 8 sharing uh, You'll notice though that I created a tag, quay.io. This is just an arbitrary string, a name that I put in here, but this is gonna allow me to now share it, which we're moving on to the next step, right? Like the next most interesting thing is sharing. So we're gonna push to quay.io. Now, as I start to get into this, let me show you a drawing here because I want you to understand what we're starting to do here. So we have went out I'm gonna to get to here. We went out to the Red Hat container catalog, verified that this is a decent image that I would approve of using. I consider this registry server a read-only registry server. Regular users cannot push container images to the Red Hat container catalog. Only Red Hat employees and, and partners that have went through our certification process can push container images to the Red Hat container catalog. So this is a starting point. Now I've pulled it down with Podman, I've built a new layer, and I'm pushing this out to Quay.io, which is a read-write registry. Now we're in an un, you know, a less trusted place where anybody could push something out there, so you have to be careful what you're gonna download from a read-write registry. But as long as it's in a repository that you control, it's obviously fairly safe. Um, and then we're gonna get down to code-ready containers, which I'll explain in a minute. But I at least wanna kinda show where we're at. So we pushed it out there. But what do we do to run it in production, right? 
As I mentioned, there's this, there's this fear in most people's stomach about moving from something like Podman to moving to something like Kubernetes. Like typically people will stumble there and I've seen customers will get stuck there for even two or three years where they just want to run a single container. And I say it's pretty easy to run a single container on a single host. As soon as you add two containers or two hosts, you have to start managing the network. So you have to start managing IP addresses and you have to start managing storage. And I've seen all kinds of very funny, I've done it myself even, I'm guilty, of doing all kinds of wacky things to manage storage. Like I'll create a directory and then within that directory I'll have subdirectories for the database container and the web service one and web service two and web service three. And next thing you know I'm creating this directory structure of chaos to then map the storage back to like which container connects to what. As soon as you have two containers, I, I, that is the, the base case if you will, if recursion if anyone that's familiar with Kershaw, the, the base case is two containers or two, two servers. And you want two containers to make it easy to organize the application. You want two servers to essentially provide for failover. So it's, a, it's an HA or a high availability thing. But either way, it starts to get hard. And that's when we have to start to think about running something in production. Um, and I mentioned that. So this is where something like OpenShift or Kubernetes comes in. Um, to demonstrate Kubernetes, I am using in this lab environment, I actually have uh, everything I've showed you so far here with Podman is on a Fedora box in a virtual machine uh, running on RHEL 8 system, and then code ready containers. So code ready containers is a way to run OpenShift 4 um, in a single virtual machine on a laptop, for example. In this case, I'm running it on a laptop. OpenShift 4 is is, is a very sophisticated piece of technology, even though I don't think people have fully absorbed what it means. It is an op, it, it's based on a technology called operators. And so the way OpenShift 4 installs itself, there are a few base container images, and in fact, even the operating system itself is saved as a container image out on our registry server, and out on Quay.io actually, and gets pulled down, installed, you know, installed on a, a virtual machine, and then all of the other components of OpenShift get pulled down as container images, and there are these things called operators, which are essentially, I, I consider them robot systems administrators. They know how to do the final deployment of all these different pieces of software. They also know how to do backup and recovery and upgrades and downgrades of all the different components in OpenShift. So OpenShift is essentially a microservices-based application itself, the platform, and it is managed by these operators. This makes it extremely easy to install with a single command, but then all of this automation is running and you're kind of like, I hope, you know, I'm relying on Red Hat's, I'm, in fact, I'm even relying on other engineering teams' expertise to make sure this whole thing works. This is very easy to do with code-ready containers. Um, code-ready containers adds one more layer of software. It adds like an installer script, and then this installer will essentially log into Libvirt, create a virtual machine on my laptop, bring up that virtual machine, deploy the, the core OS, Red Hat core OS image that is the, the operating system for OpenShift and then deploy all the container images and components and gets a full completely working OpenShift environment running in a single VM on my laptop. Now I do this instead of connecting out to Amazon. You could actually do the exact same thing with OpenShift and then just install it in Amazon or Azure or Google uh, Cloud, but but for the point of a demo, I just wanted to have it all locally so, so that we're not going out to the internet. So basically we're just having you know, we are pushing, we've pushed that container image out to Quay.io, but now we're gonna pull it down and run it in OpenShift. But the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is people get stuck here, right? They're, they're worried about, okay, now I have to get from Podman to Kubernetes. I've been stuck in this find, build, share kind of model, and I've been doing it on my laptop with Podman or Docker, but now moving to Kubernetes is tough. So to the rescue is a command called uh, kube generate, or generate kube, I call it kube generate. But um, podman generate kube is a really magical command that basically will allow us to do that simple model of just running a container and then run another command to export the YAML that I can then run in OpenShift. So for this demo, I'm gonna show you here what I'm doing. I'm running a single container, that, that one that I just showed you that I pushed out to Quay.io. I'm running it locally in podman on my laptop, or actually in this VM. Uh, here it is running. So now you can see with Podman, the container's running. I'm running the latest version of that. It's been up one second. And now once it's running, I can take this Podman generate kube. I call, the, I call this uh, container Tron. 
and then tron.yaml, I'm just making it the same name so that I can see. But, um, and then here, I'll show you. I'll generate the Kubernetes, or the Kubernetes YAML. Then we'll take a quick look at it. So as you can see, I'm lazy because I've been doing this way too long, like 20 years, and I hate writing giant long config files like this. But Podman just allowed me to do this. Now I can hack on this, change it a little bit if I need to. But the beauty here is it's actually already created the pod definition for me, the container, uh, the container definition, the command, all the things that I have to do. And so now once I have this Kubernetes YAML, I can go out to my OpenShift cluster. You'll see I have my code ready containers, OpenShift cluster running. The master, it's working, again, it's an all-in-one install where the master and the worker are both installed on the same node. You can see it's Kubernetes 114. It's 21 days old um, for the win. Um, and then I could see the projects that are in OpenShift. So um, there's a bunch of projects already configured by default in OpenShift. And think of a project as a, it's a mechanism for doing role-based access control. So you will create a project and then give certain users access to that project. And it's a way to make Kubernetes multi-tenant. Uh, so that different people that don't trust each other can all use the same system. In this case, I'm going to create a new project called Tron. Uh, you'll see that I now have created it. Uh, OpenShift has a really nice command called new project, um, and that makes it really easy. So then I get projects. You'll see my new Tron project is here. Um, and then I am now going to, I just submitted this OC create command. Um, it's essentially a kubectl create command. This dash f means file. I pass it that Tron YAML file. Now I'm going to run the exact thing that I had running in, in Podman with a single command in Kubernetes with a single command. So um, we're going to go ahead and watch this. Actually, it already came up um, because I had already cached all the images and everything is local, so this actually ran very quickly. Uh, the first time you run it, it takes about 30 seconds because you have to pull all the container images down into the code-ready containers environment, and it has to cache it. But uh, this time it ran very quickly. So we will get out of that. And then we will watch. We'll take a quick look at that. So you'll see in Kubernetes, uh, we have a pod running. You'll see it's assigned it, you know, uh, essentially to, the, to that master. Uh, we pulled down the image you see from that image that I pushed out to Quay.io. And now locally we have this thing running. So let's take a look at it. So there it is, single pod running with a single container in that pod, running in Kubernetes with like two commands. I didn't have to write any YAML whatsoever, which makes me very happy. Um, I hate doing it, but I like hacking on it once I, now again, it's not because Kubernetes is complex, it's because the business problem is complex. Running a bunch of services is complex. Nonetheless, tooling can make this easier, right? So this is great. I just showed you a very simple use case with a single container, just to kind of get your brain around it. But now say, I want to run multiple containers that talk to each other in a pod. Um, how many of you know what pods are? Okay, good, good number of people know. So a pod is, a, is, is just a concept, if you will. There's a definition, there's, there's a technical implementation of pods in Kubernetes, as in there is Golang code that defines how a pod works in Kubernetes. In Podman, we actually have the same logical definition of a pod, but different code. So we have our own implementation of how the pod actually gets fired up. Um, but it's the exact same concept. It is a, essentially a, a thing that contains one or more containers running on the same node. So you know, with Podman, you don't run multi-node applications. But you can run multiple containers in a pod on that single host. Um, the beauty of this is, is you can model an application with different pods in Podman and then move them over to Kubernetes. So in this scenario, I'm going to show you a quick uh, definition here. It's very easy to create a pod in Podman, to be honest, easier than writing the YAML in, in Kubernetes. So I go and create a pod. Um, and then here, I'm going to create a container running in that pod. So you'll see the dash dash pod option. I'm telling it, run this container in this pod. And then I give the name Flynn for those of you that recognize my Tron references. I don't know how many of you like the movie Tron. Again, I'm showing my age. Um, Podman run, we're going to add another one. We're going to run bit. Does everybody remember who bit was? OK, good. As, as like a seven-year-old, this is pretty amazing. I'm just going to point out. Um, so now, actually, Podman has a really cool feature here, this pod, pod list. It'll show us the namespaces. It'll show us the container names. Now this, 
honestly, is one of my favorite commands because so many people, if you were in my talk yesterday, fundamentally don't understand what containers are. But this shows it so clearly. So here's the name of the, the, the pod. Here's, you'll see the C group that it's running in. You can see the namespaces in the kernel that have been created. So now we know exactly which namespaces the clone system call used to create this container. And then we can see bit, flin, the two containers. And then we have this infra container. How many of you know what a pause container is? Some. OK, so with this concept of a pod, the ability to run multiple containerized processes side by side on the same host and share namespaces, which is what this is showing. So I, again, I keep adding processes to those namespaces, and now those namespaces can share memory, can share network, can share things. They essentially live in the same virtual space in the kernel. Um, but to do that, I have to create a process. You remember before I showed you, if in my last talk, I showed you when you create a container, it's just metadata on disk. There's no process running. Well, with a pod, you need to have some process running so that you get all the namespaces. It essentially holds the namespaces open, and then you can add real processes to that namespace and add the actual workloads that you want. So there's something called a pause container. And this is true in Kubernetes as well as in Podman when you create a pod. So this concept of a pod requires this thing. And essentially, a pause container is nothing more than a very small container image that has a single command in it that runs pause, that basically just creates a process that is a while one loop, that just creates a process, keeps it open, and doesn't exit. And then that process stays alive for as long as the pod is alive. And then when you kill the pod, the pause container goes away. But it does nothing more than hold the namespaces open. So we can, rec we can now see this is where the proof that the implementation of a pod is different in Podman. You'll see that this doesn't look like Kubernetes YAML. This is actually the internal data structure representation of a pod in Podman. But it's pretty easy to read. You can see. The, the three different containers, um, you can see their IDs. Um, again, these are just metadata that rep, you know, metadata labels that represent them. You can see the C groups. Again, we're kind of seeing a more robust version of what I showed you with the PS command. Um, and then here, you can see, uh, something I highlight here, you can see I had that first container that I ran, bash, the Tron one. And then you'll notice that Flynn and Bit are the new ones that I just added to the pod. Uh, but where's the pause container? There's no pause container there. So there's a, we have sort of these rules that are kind of arbitrary, but we make it easier in Podman. We don't show you the pause containers. We just show you the actual workload containers. But again, I think this confuses people. So that's why I love that PS command, where I show you all the namespaces, and you can actually see the pause container and the two workload containers together. Um, so all right, so now I have these two, these two containers running side by side in a pod, and now I want to export these. So again, single command. Instead of passing it the name of the container, I pass it the name of the pod. Um, and then I also added this little magical dash s option. So uh, I'll do this just to kind of show you what it does. This, it, this will create the Kubernetes service for me. And then let's look at this. Now I've created a much longer Kubernetes YAML file that I really wouldn't want to write from scratch. <laughs> so again, just two containers running side by side. You see how much Kubernetes YAML that is. Now again. Kubernetes isn't complex. The concept of running a bunch of services together in a powerful way is what's complex. This is probably the simplest way to represent it all in one file. Um, you know, if you think about what a Kubernetes YAML file is, it has all the definition for the containers. It has the, the network information, the ports. It automatically wires together the containers, so I don't have to worry about the IP addresses. Um, it also you know, wires together the storage. It will automatically pull in volume mounts and, and manage all that, so I don't have to worry about that myself. Um, the environment variables, um, but then the magical piece is the service. So this is what exposes it to the rest of the Kubernetes cluster, right? So we create this thing called a service that exposes these two containers to the rest of the, to the, rest of the cluster, basically. Um, and again, Podman did all this for me. So now let's get out of here, and then I'll show you how to run it. So again, I had to create another project. I decided to use the second movie, Tron Legacy, as the name. Um, and then get projects. Let's show you. I've created a new project. So now I've got a new place. I've ran the one container in the one project and run another one in the other one. Single command. Let's watch it. And then we'll watch it get created. So this is probably a good time to explain a small thing about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes works on this concept of a defined state, actual state, and then eventual consistency between the two. Um, so uh, 
if you look at old infrastructure, the way we used to do it 20 years ago, it was, there was, we did use things like configuration management. And configuration management was an approximation of a defined state, and then you would run it over and over and over again if it was item potent, hopefully getting the environment to stay kind of in line. But entropy, you know, basic entropy will say that if you have a thousand servers over a month or two months or five months or a year, they somehow end up getting out of sync. Whether it's like arbitrary physics breaking something or if it's a human being getting in and changing stuff. So it was like a slow, lazy version of this. But Kubernetes, on the other hand, with a single config file, again, not 20 different config files, but a single config file, defines the entire state of that application. And it will then go out, right now it's making the, the actual state in line with the defined state. You can think of that when I submit this to the Kubernetes API. Now it's running and the defined state and the actual state are actually in alignment. And because this is not that complex of an application and there's only a single node, it's pretty easy to keep in alignment. Now you get out to you know, a Kubernetes cluster with 500 nodes and an application that has 12 different services and you actually have things failing and network hiccups and all these things, this, this job gets a lot harder. Uh, but the beauty here is, is I don't have to worry about any of that. I can let the platform worry about that. Um, and again, if I want to delete this, that's actually the, the real magic. So now we have our pod running. Uh, we have actually, uh, you see both of these containers started. You'll see here that uh, pulled the images, started Flynn, started Bit. Uh, you'll see that the, the Tron legacy uh, you know, pod is alive, blah, blah, blah. And then um, let's show you here. See the pods. There's only a single pod in this project. The other pod's running in the other project. But this one has two, two containers. Um, but now let's do a bonus here. So I've got some time. I think I can get through a couple different bonuses. Um, we, we can all, we can, you, I showed you the generate for Kubernetes. But what if you really do want to just run a single container on a single host? Eh, you know, like I really hate writing systemd files too. Like I'm not really into writing files at all. So I'm pretty lazy. You can actually do the same thing. So, I mean, the way the Podman team is thinking is really elegant in that, in that we just are like, you know what, if I can write, if I can run it with a single command, why should I have to write all this, you know, service file definitions, and why should I write all this YAML? If I can start with something, then hack it, maybe exactly what I want. Uh, but you'll see here, I showed uh, system D, you can do that with pods or with, or with containers as well, so it's really nice. Now. Again, going back 20 years, how would I have stopped all of these services if I had deployed, if I had deployed a, a service as simple as two processes running in my 1,000-node cluster 20 years ago, how would I have deleted it? It was a giant pain. We had, we had what were called run books, and in that run book, we would have 30 different steps that we had to do. We had to go delete DNS. We had to go uh, deprecate the storage, back it up, push it out to a backup place, um, do all these different things. Um, and it was a nightmare. And I almost always broke something when I was deleting the service. And then worse, two years later, we would see something that we'd forgotten because there was some edge case that caused it to not get deleted or whatever. Um, and it would break. You know? And you'd see, you'd see these legacy pieces of, oh, I thought we deleted that service two years ago. Oh, we did. We'd have to go look through our ticket system and realize that we actually deleted it. So you had to like, figure out from the ticket system what you'd actually done, where now with Kubernetes, all of that's done for you. Like literally it's logging what you've created and what you haven't and what you've deleted and what you, you know, with deployments, I don't want to go super deep into Kubernetes, but with deployments, you actually have trackable history of when you scaled the app up, when you scaled it down, when you created it, when you deleted it. It's beautiful. So we can kill everything in Podman. I show these commands because they're, they're very elegant. It's something that always annoyed me in Docker. You had to do this stupid for loop to like delete things, whereas Podman just has a dash A option. Uh, we delete you know, the containers, uh, we kill them, then we delete the, we delete the, the copy on right layer um, from yesterday. And uh, then we kill the pod, kill this. Now, this is actually where it gets magical. Again, I could create a very, very complex service out here in, in Kubernetes, but all I have to do to delete, to, here's, here's what happens. The business person calls me up, we need to delete, deprecate this service. It's, we're not gonna use it anymore. Okay, no problem. Here's a single command to delete that. Uh, we're deprecating the other service. Okay, boom, done. End demo. Um, that, I, again, I think the breakdown of it almost is as magical as the creation of it because we were able to create it with a single YAML file that we exported from Podman that we just ran. So we could hack on it, hack on it, get it the way we want, build the YAML file, export it, run it in Kubernetes. Um, now, I want to show you, this is what I went through. I, I have like five more minutes, so I'm gonna show you one more demo. 
Um, this is what I showed you in the main demo, but I built this the other day. <laughs> so I get, I get this question of how to use Azure pipelines with UBI. Um, and I think this use case is interesting from a cloud native perspective. So you'll see it looks quite similar to the use case that we just did. This I would consider like, this is the find, run, build journey right here. But this is sort of the cloud native journey. A lot of times we don't even want to build it locally. We just want to build it out in some service. We want to have like Azure pipelines or Jenkins or, or you know, uh, Cirrus CI or something like that go out and build all this stuff for us over and over again. I don't want to have to mess with it. So, but, but if you look, it's still a similar thing. I want chain of custody, right? I want to have the chain of custody from the Red Hat Container Catalog into Azure Pipelines in an account I control. Then I want to push it out to Quay.io, and then I want to share it only with the hosts that I want consuming it. Um, so the, the process is pretty similar. Um, I didn't, I, I forgot to actually show you this when I pushed it out to Quay.io. I meant to show you. Here are my repositories out at Quay.io. You'll see some of them are public, and the ones with a lock around them are private. Um, and they're only private because I forgot to share them, but, but, um, but you, you, again, you can kind of control what you want out there. So in this demo, I show, I actually created an Azure one. Uh, I believe it is called UBI Azure Pipeline Source. So I, you'll see I have two different repositories out there. This is actually one that I created for the source and one I created for the build. Um, uh, but, but basically, in a nutshell, what Azure Pipelines allows you to do is use a single, I'll go out to Azure Pipelines and I'll show you this, it allows you to use a single um, YAML file to cause the builds to kick off. So again, our build might look something like this, where we have like a Docker file. Um, and then our, I actually show how to build the source. I just, uh, I just installed SSH, which I don't even actually know if you need to do. Um, and then here, uh, you'll see it's an Azure Pipelines file is quite similar to a Kubernetes file in that it's like this YAML thing but it defines, here what I'm showing you is we pull from, we basically pull, see, we pull from Red Hat Universal Base Image from the container catalog, and then we push the image to Quay.io. And now the beauty of this is this service is sitting out there and it's just doing whatever it wants, and uh, the only time it will change is when I ch make a change to the, to the Docker file or this file. So essentially it's a GitOps workflow where when I go commit a new change into GitHub, it will actually, so let's actually go and do that and then kick off a build. Let's see what I can do here. Let's, um, let's go to, this is where I get it off the script a little bit. But let's do this, let's do a, let's actually add a yum install. So I'll SSH, I don't know. See what, what that does, it might fail, but whatever. So I've made a change here, and you'll see in my pipeline here, oh, you'll see it kicked off a job, right? Because what happened is Azure Pipeline saw that I changed. Oh wait, no, it didn't show it yet. It's supposed to. There it is, all right, so it did kick off a job. You'll see now we have a new job running. I made a commit to GitHub, now automatically Azure Pipelines is, is seeing that I changed something and now it's running this job and it's doing something quite similar to what I showed you with Podman, but it's doing it, it's doing it out at Azure Pipelines and you'll see it'll actually just walk through and show you what's going on and then when it's done, it will push the image out to Quay.io and I'll have a new image. Um, and so it's, it's actually a very elegant workflow. So here it goes, it's pushing it, boom. It's actually the same or it should be pretty similar, but. Um, passed their finalized job, so now, boom, succeeded. So now this did all that human work, I, I'm now out of it. Like, I might have started with Podman, and then once I kind of get what I want, you know, and I kind of hack on it locally, I can now ship that container, you know, that, that build file, the Docker file out to Azure Pipelines or some other service. I just show Azure Pipelines because people kept asking me. Um, and then you can see now, you could apply this, this methodology to anything. And now this really helps you stay in that integrate, deploy, side of, you know, I showed here, this will help you stay in this territory, you know, where it's just kind of constantly, this, this, most of this stuff over here should be automated, right? So I would consider that Azure Pipelines part of this integrate thing, where you would just have that integration happening automatically. Every time developers change things, things will just kick off and build, and we will only worry about it if it fails, basically. So with that, I'm going to close and say, you know, there's, there's some information here I show a little bit. 
Um, and then I have some more here where you can read some things. I publish prolifically. I write a lot of blogs. There's a blog on that Azure Pipelines, how to set it up if you want. Um, I don't think I put it on here yet because I just published it. Actually, I think it publishes Monday. I'm sorry. I think that Azure Pipelines blog that shows how to do this. So it's like really fresh material. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think I have like five minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Say that one more time. Yeah, we we basically just use the Kubernetes API. So we just we just target the the Kubernetes API. So we just implement it exactly as it is. Yeah, but how is it with the old version? For example, if I want to export some uh, containers, you know, and uh, importing it to the new version of the Kubernetes. That would be fine. Um, so so let me let me back up and say, okay. So you said how is compatibility between Podman export generate kube? And, and Kubernetes. The short answer is we don't implement all of Kubernetes. We implement a very small subset, like service and pod and container. So just the bare minimum to get you started. Anything more advanced than that, you're going to be you know, hacking that yourself. But it's at least enough to get started. And then we do the same thing the other way. So you can pull a very complex Kubernetes YAML file out of Kubernetes and run it. There's actually a, a, Kubernetes, or there's a Podman play Kubernetes, and you can actually play a Kubernetes file. Now, again, it will ignore anything advanced. It will just run the pods and containers in the service. Um, we don't even do volumes yet, but we're working on that. Um, but, but yeah, it's enough to get you started. It's never meant to be a production thing, more like something that you can kind of easily get between the two to bridge the gap. Um, and also, I think it targets that use case of, of Docker Compose. Like, in my mind, my annoyed, you know, old, creaky sysadmin bones I get annoyed by having two different config files, Docker Compose and Kubernetes YAML, and they kind of do the same thing, and we can't share them, and it's annoying to me. I would rather, in a perfect world, I would rather everybody run a single node Kubernetes and just share the Kubernetes YAML files, but in lieu of that, because not everyone will do it, they get annoyed, uh, at least Podman can play them. So you could, you know, one, one Podman user could generate, the other one could play, and you could share the Kubernetes YAML files between each other instead of the Docker Compose file. So that's, that's kind of the use cases. Any other questions? Uh, you can do signing with Scopio. So you can do simple signing with GPG keys. So if you look, Scopio has a sub-command for signing. Um, and so you build them with Podman, then you sign them with Scopio, and then you push them. And you can move those signatures wherever you want. They're just shared on web servers. It's, uh, it's configurable in Podman and Cryo to go verify those, those signatures. You just point them out to a web server, basically, and they pull the, the GPG keys, and they'll, they'll verify. And so you can prevent it from pulling it. It actually works on pull. It'll prevent a pull if it doesn't verify the image, if you want to set that up. What was that? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. He asked, what about signing of container images? And so I was explaining you can do it with, with, with Scopio. I didn't quite understand the question. Um, what do you mean? OK, the question is, what if you use Helm? But I don't quite know. There, well, I'll say this. There's no plan to be able to run Helm with Podman. Uh, that feels pretty advanced. I feel like if you're down the Helm route that far, you probably want to run a Kubernetes instance locally. That's my architect brain speaking. I don't have the answer, but that's my, that's my recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the lead developers of Podman will kill me if I come back and say that I want Helm support. I'm looking at Dan right now. I see him over there shaking his head. <laughs> um, so here's the problem with product management, the job I do. I have unlimited wants and a very, very finite budget. <laughs> and I probably would say, again, a developer is not blocked from doing that today. They could run code-ready containers on their laptop, run Helm in OpenShift 4, and do all this development. But it's going to eat up more resources. But it's, at least you're not blocked. It's just suboptimal. Like, you would rather do with Podman. I totally get it. But I couldn't stack rank that as one of the highest <laughs> priorities for Podman. 
Any other questions? Are we done? Okay, we have four minutes. Somebody? Uh, could you repeat the question one more time? The, 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 I heard. Oh, cry CTL versus Podman. Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between CRI, CTL, and Podman? Okay, hold on. I have, a, I have your answer. CRI, CTL, Podman. Juan, watch this. I actually published this. <laughs> um, so uh, I actually I think I published this, or maybe Dan did. No, I think I, think I did. Uh, no, it was Dan did, sorry. I, I, I stole Dan's thunder. But uh, I did do this drawing for him, so I, I, hope, I, feel, I feel happy in that. Um, so in a nutshell, I would encourage you to read this, but uh, in a nutshell, CRI CTL is a very simple utility. The only things it can really do are like look at the images, see what's running, it can like do a PS, it can do images, it can do, it has a few subcommands, but it doesn't build images, it doesn't do, uh, it's a very, I would consider it a troubleshooting utility in production versus Podman's more of a developer focused use case where it's very rich, a rich set of subcommands to do all kinds of things. CRI CTL is just a very bare minimum to troubleshoot things mostly. In a, in a, and also just to be compatible and help implement the standard, the CRI standard. It's like a human interface into CRI so that at least you have some utility to troubleshoot if CRI is actually working right, that kind of thing. All right, I think we are, we have two minutes, I think, right? With, with, uh, with UBI? Yeah. Uh, well, legally, so this is the funny part. Sadly, I've become way too accustomed with the lawyers. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, there's nothing illegal about it, but we would never support it. So running, it wouldn't boot. It has no kernel. So if you export it as an OVI, OVA, it would, all right, let me repeat the question. The question was, can you use UBI, like if you exported Red Hat Universal Base Image as an OVA file? An OVA file is a is a standard for saving virtual machines for, for uh, you know, KVM. Um, and the short answer is, if you did it, it wouldn't boot because there's no kernel. We don't release the kernel because in containers. There would be nothing illegal about that, but to be very honest, it would be basically useless because it wouldn't be supportable. In that scenario, I would probably recommend just using CentOS. So he asked, if you added the CentOS uh, kernel to UBI to boot it, would that be... The, the question then becomes is why do it? Because like I'd rather just use all the CentOS bits that were built together and kind of work together and then rely on the CentOS community to support me. Because Red Hat would never support this Frankenstein thing. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay we are done. Thank you, everyone.